So the three readers today, they live in North Carolina. So in a way we are honoring the home poets. And I will say very little, once they come here, please feel free to say something that's, uh, that you feel I've left out, but is important for the reading and the work that you're going to do. And also I'm going to introduce all the three poets because once the reading begin, I do not like to interrupt the flow. You will read, you know, I'll just mention the order in which you're going to read. And once you begin, that will be it. So because of that, I introduced all the three poets at once. And we're going to begin with Eric Nelson, whose book is Horse Not Zebra, and it came out this year, published by Tara Keen. And he lives here in Asheville, and he has written six poetry books. And he's also a gardener, a farmer, previously a teacher, and still a teacher in the Great Smokies writing program. He has had his work published in different channels that include The Sun, Poetry, The Oxford American, Poetry Daily, and Verse Daily. And I'm delighted that you're going to buy his book today, but there's also you know, available some of his poets, you can access them online. And then we will end with Joseph Bacanti. And he's a former poet laureate of North Carolina, this between 2012 and 2014. And he's also a recipient of the North Carolina Award in Literature. He has authored over 19 books, or around 19 books, which is a lot and very impressive. And he will be reading from Light at the Seam, which came out from LSU Press. Uh, he's also the McFarlane Family Distinguished Professor of Interdisciplinary Education at Appalachian State University in Boone. And he has also served as the 2016 Charles George VA Medical Center writer in residence in Asheville. And he is the co-founder of the Medical Center's creative writing program. He will read today from the latest collection, but again, feel free to read from any work you've brought. And one of the things that cuts across all these three books is really the yearning for home and the search for home, whether that home includes the, the homes that are vanishing, whether it includes, it speaks to the old country or it speaks to the remarkable figures like great grandmothers that we miss and that, that became home to people. And also it includes the natural environment that is in danger and, and also the homes that are captured in photographs, the homes that we carry in memories and also the homes that are imaginary, that appeal to us when we're using the tarot or when we're out in a chapel, in a temple meditating, or when we are out in the world, in the woods, and we happen to see other creatures who live here with us. So please, Eric Nelson, you're welcome. Um, well, thanks everybody for coming and thank you, Mildred, and thank you, Stephanie and Mel, perhaps particularly for supporting uh, local writers and uh, keeping our books on your shelves and uh, sponsoring venues like this uh, for us to share our work. Um, I have two books that are taking up space on the shelves here, uh, so I thought I'd read a little bit from both of them. Um, I'm going to start with Some Wonder, which came out in 2015. Can you all hear me okay? Okay. Um, this came out in 2015 from Jabal Press, and I'll read a few poems from it. The thing I love about the mountains is that they give you perspective. You know, that, um, they show you literally and figuratively what's what's big and what's small and uh, what lasts and what doesn't. And I think also what's important and what's not so important. So if the wages of sin are death, I think the wages of mountain or mountains are life and perspective. 
the wages of mountains. We lay down our bills and imbalances for mountains, wildflowers loud and green pastures. We wake to the gargle of rivers, work to the whistle of cardinals. Clouds empty their pockets at our feet. Stretched half in grass and half in dust, the black snake speaks in tongues, unsaving its skin. We scratch our itch on bark, hunt honey, our sweetest selves. Pitched in dew, the spider's tent is our revival. We lie down with the moon floating up. The biggest banks cannot touch that free balloon. This poem uh, sort of gets its start from the movie Body Heat, um, which came out in 1981. You may remember if you're sort of in the vicinity of my age. And William Hurt and Kathleen Turner in it. Um, in the very first scene, when they first meet and they're talking for a while, Kathleen Turner says to him, uh, you're not very bright. I like that in a man. Uh, and, you know, you just think, uh oh, you know, he's in trouble. Um, but this poem is about another scene in the movie that is also interesting to me. Gun on the table. My favorite scene in Body Heat has nothing to do with the intricate plot that William Hurt and Kathleen Turner devised to kill her rich, oppressive husband. My favorite scene, maybe 10 seconds long, shows Hurt getting into his car as an antique roadster drives by, a fully costumed clown at the wheel, waving. Hurt stares, slightly bewildered, while the clown passes and disappears. That's it. Cut to Hurt and Turner in another sweaty sex scene and post-coital planning, the foregone noir conclusion closing in. Meanwhile, since we know there are no meaningless details in art, we keep expecting the clown to reappear or at least figure somehow in the action. Like Chekhov said, if there's a gun on the table in act one, it had better be fired by act three. <coughs> but no, clown is random there and gone. Just like many of the events that pass us every day, and we barely notice because life isn't art, isn't revised for coherence, not until our lives collapse around us like a circus tent in flames, and we begin to look around for the warning we missed. Years ago, uh, my wife Stephanie decided we needed chickens in the backyard. And I was very much against the idea. But after we got the chickens, I, I was surprised at how quickly I grew attached to them. Better angels, adrift, unpinned, their lost feathers settle at my feet, heads cocked and clucking, the chickens follow me, listening to my prayers, which are plans for the garden, fig trees, blueberries, a bridge across a pond crackling with flame bright fish. I can't abide angels, overrated guardians of no one. I believe in these earthy murmurs patrolling my yard in plain attire, keeping their wings to themselves, flying only in emergencies, gracelessly, and close to the ground where emergencies occur. So for some poems from the new book, Horse Not Zebra, published by Terrapin Books just this past April, 
I'm going to start with the first poem in case anyone is wondering about the title. Another thing I wanted to say about Malaprops is that you have excellent bookmarks that you give out free. Or not zebra. When med students are learning how to diagnose symptoms, they're told, think horse, not zebra. The common, not the erotic, not the exotic, sorry. <laughs> Which is good advice, even if you're not a doctor. Like when your phone rings at three in the morning, think wrong number, not who died. Or if your love is an hour late for dinner and hasn't called to explain, think gridlock, not head on, dead zone, not dead. When the guy in the truck doesn't slow down, much less stop when you step into the crosswalk, think distracted, not son of a bitch. Recall the time your mind was still at work, how shocked you were to see in your rear view a woman in the crosswalk flipping you off with both hands. And if you're steaming in a mile long backup because protesters have blocked the bridge again, don't think where are the damn cops when you need them. Think how when popping sounds wake you at night, you think firecracker, not gun. Got to consult my crib sheet. So whenever I get hopeful that uh, there's going to be some meaningful progress on social issues uh, and especially on climate change, it seems always to just not quite work out. There are not enough votes. There's not enough effort. Um, there's not enough people, so it's uh, frustrating. In fact, you know, the Senate uh, just passed the Biden's big climate change bill along with everything else. So I hope it, hope it passes the House and he signs it. But even so, it's been whittled down quite a bit um, in the process. Almost enough, like that rainy night, after poker when Jim backed his car off the driveway into the ditch and the five of us pushed first from the back, then from the front, then side to side, each time thinking the wheels were about to spin free. When we gave up, the car was stuck deeper in the muck and our shoes were caked. Or the time the stone bench caved in after the hurricane washed out the ground beneath it. There were enough of us to right the legs, but when we lifted the granite slab to reseat it, someone's grip slipped and it sank into the ground like a grave marker. There were almost, but not quite enough of us writing letters and calling for swing sets instead of asphalt, parks before parking lots, the woods rather than condos called the woods. Almost enough voted against coal ash pits and pig waste ponds, so hurricanes of the new climate won't sweep ash and shit river by river to the ocean, fish rising up dead as they go. There's almost enough of us to wipe oil from a thousand gulls before they suffocate. Almost enough to drag dolphins back into water deep enough for them to get away from us. Almost enough of us to pull the arrows from the eagle's grasp, pass the dimmed lamp to the smallest hands, almost enough to save a bucket at a time, this house from burning down. When I graduated from college with my English degree, uh, the first real job that I applied for was being the bookmobile driver for Floyd County, Virginia. It was a very exciting prospect for me. Perfect work. 
when I consider how my working life's been spent, I think fondly of driving the Floyd County bookmobile, an old school bus refitted with rows of shelves and a built-in desk behind the driver's seat so I could swivel smoothly from driver to librarian. I see myself ripping the wheel, chugging narrow mountain roads, navigating hairpins to the parking lot of Andy's Summit Mart where they wait, three or four kids running around, grandmas smoking and shouting at the kids to settle, and the wiry man in the tractor cap off to one side, like he may or may not be here to browse the war books. I always hesitate before opening the door, a pause to let everyone, including me, absorb the marvel before us, a movable feast, other worlds on wheels three steps above the top of the towering mountain. Now when I slouch into my office, down on the world or myself, especially the days I don't think I can stand one more stab at my work, I imagine the bookmobile crossing the new river through clouds, past meadows and pastures, cows as my witness, my heavy cargo leaning back, me leaning forward, looking for the parking lot, shining in the sun like a small lake. How I wish I had gotten that job, never thankless or boring, never less than fulfilling. So I guess that's the way it is with perfect work. It's a job that you don't get uh, it's the most perfect. I'm gonna finish with a poem called Clearing the air, it's the first poem in this book. He's drifting out of the woods, head bowed, right arm raised and waving slowly the way someone in church reaches God. About my age, he's dressed as I am, cargo shorts, t-shirt, low rise hikers, a version of me approaching me. And I'm touched to witness his communion, the summer foliage, an eternity of tunnels and arches, the sun modeled trails scrolling through trees like illuminated script. As we near each other, he smiles a little sheepishly, lowers his arm and says, don't worry, I've cleared the air for you. Now I see he wasn't praying, but shielding his face from webs. On his sleeve, an orb weaver scrambles toward his neck. I don't tell him, I feel wronged somehow. Not that I care about the webs or spiders, they'll be back tomorrow. But floating from the woods that way, head down, arm up. I wanted a seeker, returning from wandering, answer in hand. Then a branch snapped me back to me in the woods with the dog, as I am every morning, thinking to-dos, minding the poison ivy, urging the dog to his business. No epiphany in sight, no holy whispers in the canopy. Yet I keep yearning for them. And already I'm envisioning tonight, spiders stringing the trees, not with sticky traps, but with an array of harp-like instruments tuned by wind and by dew. That's it, thank you. Can you guys hear me okay? Perfect. Uh, my name is Emily, for those of you who don't know me, and I'm going to be sharing five tomes from my debut collection entitled Yuluvi. Um, but first, I just wanted to thank everybody for being here this afternoon. I'm delighted to read with Joseph and Eric. And Eric, I really liked that line about you know, emergencies occurring near the ground. I That rang true for me for some reason, especially as someone who is prone to be thinking about the zebra, not the horse when things go wrong. Um, so I'm delighted to be here with the both of you. And also thank you to Stephanie and to Mildred and to everybody at Malaprops. Um, I have so much 
admiration for other writers, but especially those who then actively create opportunities for other poets and writers and readers to congregate together. It's just an extra gift that they give to the community. So I appreciate that a lot. So I can't remember if I said, but um, my book came out in May um, from Unsolicited Press. That's a small press in Portland. And even though it just came out, I started writing the first poems in this book about 10 years ago in 2012, when I was living abroad in Prague and I was trying to find the small farming village from which my great great grandparents Im immigrated um, in the 1920s and the 1930s. And I'd been working on this project for so long, y'all, and I just didn't know what poem needed to open the collection. It was really just this tricky thing I couldn't get through until I attended AWP one year and Philip B. William was giving a talk on first books. And he said that the first poem, especially of your first book, should be a tour guide for the rest of the collection. And when he said that to me, I knew exactly what poem I wanted to open the collection. And I apologize in advance if there are native or fluent Czech speakers out there. Um, I'm, I'm gonna do my best, we'll get through. <laughs> The poem is entitled Ravne Abhuprava. Beneath a row of witches, she sweeps the sidewalk in front of her souvenir shop. I've wandered past my map's reach. We are alone with the cobblestones and cold light of sweet street lamps sweating copper shadows on our faces. Her back bent more fantastic than the gnarled handle in her grasp. Each evening breeze, breeze flight into the pulpit of puppets above. I am not afraid of women made mythical and immoral, spinsters with snarled spines. I fear instead the loud thoughts that taunt the lost, those who cannot find home without being shown where to go. Promente, I ask. Permission to break the silence the street has laced like a shawl around her shoulders. Gedeye metrum. She answers in a spell of syllables indiscernible to my ears. Finally, she casts a glance far into the dark. Gravne a doprava. Doprava, I repeat, my tongue an apprentice in unfamiliar sounds. Diki, I offer. Heski chair into the hazy navy of the night. Doprava, straight and to the right. So this next poem is one of my favorites in the collection, but I feel the need to tell you guys that it didn't happen. And I share that for two reasons. Are y'all familiar with Macaulay Culkin, the actor right here in Home Alone? Okay, so one night I had a dream I was dating Macaulay Culkin, and I don't think I have a crush on him in my waking life, but he was my boyfriend in this dream, and in the dream, I swear to you guys, he looks at me and he goes, you have a poem to write, and I woke up and I wrote this poem. So, yeah, it's, this is not true, but then when one of my aunts read this collection, she specifically messaged me about this poem, and she said, I talked to your grandmother, and she said this didn't happen. And that led to a really interesting conversation about poetic license and emotional truth. Um, so this poem is not technically true, but the emotion behind it is. It's entitled Baking Lessons. Across the kitchen counter, my grandmother needs kolachki dough. The walls are goldenrod, puckered as the pastries. Warmth has made a womb of this room of the thumb-pressed pockets she fills with poppy seeds. Grandma, I ask, what's love like? She says, the love of a sister is a deep stain, the way plums purple everything. No, Grandma, not like that. She says, a mother's love is a dumpling, how its body plumps to meet your cheeks. No, Grandma, no. She says, a daughter's love is sour cream, cool yet prone to curdle. She places small suns in each palm, peach jam glazes lazily in their pits. Cheese and cherries, chipped platters on which the sweets are stacked. No, Grandma, love. What is real love like? Oh, that. Well, real love, she says, is the sound a fork makes as it scrapes a plate.
clean. Um, so I didn't think it would be fair to have y'all look at the cover of this collection during my reading without sharing a little bit about the photo. Um, so this is my great grandmother and my great grandfather on their wedding day. It's 1940 St. Miller um, Catholic Church in Chicago. And I asked my book designer, my cover designer, if we could just have a photo of my grandparents on the cover as an homage to them, but also as an homage to um, Rita Doves, Thomas and Beulah. That collection was very important for me in the process of writing this book. Um, and a cool fun fact is this collection came out 11 days after my own wedding. Um, so not quite the same, but 11 days is close enough. So this poem is about this photo. It's entitled, My Great Grandmother at Gladys's Bride. Scalloped and yellowing, the frame itself is buttercream. Everything in the image spills over. A ring of the groom's dark hair on his forehead, the bride's lace veil as it lifts and lowers, the laughter a bride's maid tries, catching in a cupped hand. The bride is all cheeks and crinoline, groom with a mischievous windswept grin. I can see my mother's face in the bride's, the way I see my own, reflected in a pool of water, luminous and distorted. This next poem did happen. It's entitled Burning the Witches. Will the fire still whistle and spit around my offerings? Will the flame's strange orange syntax mourn as it melts the flesh that once fed it? At the edge of this Czech village, visitors are welcome to witness the staged burning of witches. Tonight is the stomach of spring, midpoint between the equinox and summer solstice. Scarecrow witches are sacrificed, fastened with sapling to the pyre, since their power weakens as the weather warms, the night will be set alight in hopes the flush will usher them out. I stand surrounded by a crowd of flood-lit faces, sparks sharpening the angle of every chin, every grin cast sinister in copper shadow, and I among them, wishing winter away just as hurriedly, but horrified of the origins bonfire has in innocent bones. We each throw our own kind of coal into the young flame. Someone throws a name, another in ocean. Any memory that can be used against us is purged. The ocean burns green like copper and zinc, and I want my bones to burn too. Vinocha kajda kochka cherna. Want to whisper that women have never been afraid to lean into the heat. And to close my reading, I wanna share the last poem of the collection, which also gave me trouble. Um, this one I did not have for a very, very long time. This was the last piece in the collection that was written years later. Like I think I had a pretty much a finished draft besides the anchor poem, I didn't have that. Until I came across this poem entitled Ancestors by Kiki Petrosino. I love her work and I became obsessed with this poem. And so I also named my poem ancestors because I borrowed very heavily from her work um, and this is an homage to the poem or to her poem but it also anchors out my book ancestors one grieves gorgeous as worship another lies in a field the shape of your face one of them asks about their accordion there's one the color of a garnet one like chamomile there's one braiding basil leaves into dough, her aproned ghost handing out kolachki. You find a fur one, a fermented one, one made of honey. One lives in cobblestones, one in the spire's sweaty reach. One misread empress as temptress and has been haunting accordingly ever since. One has finally learned to write by watching others swim. S and T, the crest of wet shoulders. One catches your coughs in a gold goblet. You remember the one who begs a fevered forgiveness for all the sickness she spread. You've wasted so much rain waiting for the one who refuses to appear, no matter how sincere your summoning. 
being one person in this lineage is no more than being one letter of a language written yet unaware of words. Thank you. perfect. Hi, everyone. Yeah, thanks for being here. And, and thank you, Mildred, Stephanie, and Malaprops. I've read here over the years a number of times. And it's just such a pleasure. It's just good to be in this building um, with you and all these books and so proud to, to read with Emily and, and Eric such, such impressive poems. Uh, before I begin reading, I'm going to read a letter. Um, there's a there's an organization, a national organization called Writers for Democratic Action. And there's also um, the North Carolina Steering Committee for Writers for, for Democratic Action. And I'm on that steering committee with Philip Gerard, Jill McCorkle, Jackie Shelton Green, Bland Simpson, Bell Boggs, Thomas Mills, Wiley Cash, Lynn York, Alex Albright, Margaret Bauer, and Gabrielle. Calvo Caressi. We are writers. We value truth, both the truthfulness of facts and the truth of the human heart. This is our truth. As citizens of a democracy, we enjoy many precious freedoms, including the freedom to express our views without fear of censorship or reprisal. To guard this and other freedoms, we wholeheartedly accept the responsibilities and duties of citizenship to our local community, to our state, and our nation. Our most important civic duty is to vote. Voting is a fundamental right, but it is also our prime obligation as stewards of democracy. We live in a moment when democracy is under attack, not just in foreign countries, but right here in the United States. There are too many politicians and their supporters who would rather simply take power than win it at the ballot box by persuasion and reasoned argument. They would rather many of our citizens did not exercise the right and duty to vote. They make it difficult for certain kinds of citizens to vote, especially the young, the poor, and those in minority communities. They can do voting districts through gerrymandering, guarantee the outcomes they desire. They even seek to manipulate the process of counting and certifying ballots. The only sure way to counter the cynical attack on our democracy is to vote in every election for every office. No matter how inconvenient or frustrating the process can seem, standing in line to cast our vote is the most powerful means we have to keep our democracy alive, to guarantee that the freedoms we now enjoy remain intact and that we indeed offer liberty and justice to all. When you cast your ballot, your vote is irrevocably recorded, booked. It's a simple process, but crucial to our future as free citizens. So please stand with us, do your part, book your vote. I've just been reading that in all my readings for the past, for the past many months. Um, this book, uh, a new book called Light at the Seam is, is um, set in the Southern Appalachians, primarily in North Carolina. And it's about mountaintop removal and it's about a lot of other things, but primarily mountaintop removal. So I'm gonna just move around a little bit in, in, that, in that collection. And the first thing I'm gonna read is a, is a poem called Removing the Mountain from the Coal. Everybody I, I know is pretty, familiar with traditional coal mining where you tunnel into a mountain and you pull the coal out of the mountain's guts, if you will, out of its stomach. Um, with mountaintop removal, um, the mountain is essentially lobotomized, shaved down and shaved down and shaved down, and the mountain is taken away from the coal, leaving the coal denuded and then it's, it's hauled off. Um, that process begins with clear cutting, of course. Imagine the millions of trees that are just slaughtered um, and just thrown in the valley for the most part, um, not to mention all of the 
you know, all of the families that are displaced. So, so folks that once looked up at a mountain like we do here, if you can imagine these glorious peaks, our suddenly being able to be higher than them and look down at them. And I'm greatly oversimplifying the process. It's, it's horrifying because of the floods, um, the erosion. You, you've all been hearing about the terrible floods in Kentucky lately. Uh, Kentucky is one of, the, one of the states that suffers most from mountaintop removal. Um, poison, toxins, slurry ponds, um, removing the mountain from the coal. And, and one of the things that I think about is that these mountains, the oldest extant mountain range on earth, also harbor memories, um, vaults of memory and archives, et cetera. And when the mountains are chipped away and taken away, the, those touchstones to our identity are also um, eviscerated. Lorries at that altitude defy gravity, cross hatching, a bric a brac of switchback Z's. They're unearthed, ruined in the clouds. It's overburdened in the valley. Something with not only the will, but the ordinance, ammonium nitrate, to blow 400 meters off the mountain's frontal lobe of cortex where memory once construed, its infinite vaults and archives, the oldest extant range on earth, a record of the moment on the third day of Genesis when Jehovah whispered, let the dry land appear. Then the transcripts of what followed ever after, gone. Gray matter and emerald striate tear, black twinkle vast impoundments, slurries lurk across the horizon, eastern Kentucky, Tennessee, all of West Virginia into Western Virginia, summits picket, massive reds, yellow autumnal fire, light breaks about their faces understories flower. Most 18 of these poems um, were inspired by, by a photographic exhibition by Carl Gailey, uh, a nature photographer from, from Winston-Salem. In, in his exhibit was ca called um, Lost on the Road to Oblivion the vanishing beauty of, of coal country. And he had, an ex, he had an exhibition at the Turchin Center for Visual Art at Appalachian State where I teach. And I was asked to basically to write acrostic poems based on Carl's images. So, so lasting, um, and we, we became great friends too. So, so lasting, um, thanks to Carl. You know, without, without him, no, no poems. Not these, anyhow. This is called Limbo. It's after, it's after a photograph by Carl called Almost Heaven. In Almost Heaven, Carl Gailey's photograph, composed from the vantage of heaven, I finally witnessed Limbo, precisely as I pictured it. An endless sweep of the ancient Appalachian chain, just the peaks in autumnal brilliance, to their chins in cottony vapor, an imprimatur of fathomless white from here to Nineveh. Limbo is indeed almost heaven, but decidedly not heaven, where unbaptized babies ever smoldering with original sin are sentenced for eternity, never to gaze upon the brow of Yahweh. Though the catechism confirms they're not in pain, happy at this altitude, among the infinite pixels of the firmament, swaddling them, excluded in clouds, the afterlife created on the second day. This one's called Near Fayette Station. It takes place in West Virginia. Well north of East Mountain, after Glen Jean, the last town conjuring a woman until Jane Lou, even further north, beyond the 88-story bridge levitating above the New River Gorge, you pass in Oak Hill, the church of Saints Peter and Paul, make the sign of the cross, then again at the West Virginia Office of Mines, 
genuflect to Leonard of Knobloch, patron saint of coal miners, his charge and chisel, his martyrdom in the seam of Black Sun Mine. Beneath Route 19, Wolf Creek unravels through its boulder flume near Fayette Station. Speed blurred, white is the cumulo nimbi, coursing the gap into the open where the wolf rants into the new, heaving in its chasm. The next is called Sentences. It's about a coal mining disaster in, in eastern Tennessee. Um, And, there, and it, it starts with an epigraph from Diane Gilliam. And I don't know if you know her book called Kettle Bottom. It's, it's miraculous. I mean, it's just quite the book, just a knockout. And, and this is from her poem, Explosion at Winco, number nine. It is true that it is the men that goes in, but is us that carries the mind inside. The work of rescue through Cumberland granite favors piety. The liturgy of pump and drill, dirge and hymn, the feudal knell of blade on stone, nine days without respite, the tumult of hearts dredging hope over long. The women are statues, mouth set and chiseled lines, gaunt dresses, the querulous yearning faces of their children baby birds whose portion lay swaddled in the ebon seam. At the shaft house, they queue, awaiting the cage, finely blue lips, black fingers, nine days bearded, notes pinned to their blouses. These were not men beholden to words on a page, the flailing sentences, their hands willed toward farewell, syllables tailing down, and gently down, too faint to make out. And of course, you know, when those, when those miners knew that they would not be rescued, they would, they would write notes to their, their loved ones and pin them to their, to their shirts. Um, this next poem is called Dulcimer. I bought it on Friendship Church Road in Aho for $50. A four string that rings bright as the day it was strung by Squire Elsie Weaver, the luthier that built it. The soundboard's finish is spruce pine, steam to hourglass shape the sides. The inner's oak for tone, body black walnut, ivory tuning pegs, frets or bone. And long hips below its waist swirled slash sound holds, seahorse shaped. And in the slender bodice above, on either side of the sound bar, bore nine punctures like 22 slug eyelets, auger clean, arranged in an S, sealed with hide or fish glue, one, then ruby shellac cut with alcohol, chamfered edges, sanded round, smooth, though nothing dainty, brown as turned earth blood heft of a newborn. I studied it for initials, some signature, fetish, or brand. I poured over it with my tongue, found nary a trace of Elsie. Pluck it with quill, slide and stop the strings with a stick. Use your fingers. It takes to praise a calloused hand. So I have, I have two more poems. Um, this next one is called The Coal Miner's Wife. Um, you know, and it's after Ezra Pound's adaptation from the Chinese of Li Po's The Ridge River Merchant's Wife, A Letter. I don't know if you know that poem. It's just a it's just a fabulous poem. It was in the very first anthology 
that I ever taught from just a trillion years ago. Um, and I loved the poem instantly, and it was anthologized off, and then it just kind of disappeared from anthologies. Um, so again, this is called The Coal Miner's Wife, A Letter, and it has an epigraph from Lee Poe himself, Southern women have alabaster skin. We were from the same town, Cowan, along the gully, Webster County, church twice a Sunday, Wednesday evening prayer meeting. I swore to every wit of it, hair chopped in bangs across my brow. I played in moonflowers and bleeding hearts. Subterranean, even as a boy, feats were nothing to you. You crawled the culvert pipe to save blind Ruby's kitten, one eye blue, the other mahogany. Its affliction was deafness, plague, the white feline. It could not hear thunder. Rain unfolded from the sky, another flood coming on. My father is years deep in the pit. My mother, silent as plums. What happened to that kitten? Blind Ruby's trailer ripped loose when the branch left its bank. Sycamores bent over the eddies. He whispered in my ear before that sentence, there had been nobody. At 14, we married. As foretold, you went to the mines, left Mondays, the scullery salt box with your pail, and drove off for wages underground in Fayette County. Never you pressed me, never I shied, nor from the rag to scrub the black, what you could not reach when after years in the pit hunched, you could only so far lift your arms. Five months now, I have not seen you save your smudged letters, your endearments and smoke. My darling, coyotes weep from the cliffs above the gully's white water. I plant every genus of dahlia, emerald moss at the door sill. It is September 3rd, the anniversary of my father's death in Elkins coal field. Seven years now, Billings Meadow has not been threshed. The Buckeyes refuse to fall. Queen Anne's lace prospers, butterfly bushes grand as pipe organs. Yesterday on Agnes Ridge, I saw an albino woolly worm auguring snow or manna one. Let me know you're coming. I will trek out to meet you as far as Camden on Gully. And then this last poem is the title poem, Light at the Seam. This is the afterlife, threshold of oblivion, a blacktop crest on Pine Mountain, Bell County, Kentucky, U.S. Route 119 burning north through the heart of coal until it plays out frozen in Dubois, PA. Out of gauzy lavender fog, the wakened sun swoons in white robes. Jesus, flanked by Moses and Elijah, transfigured up into a high mountain apart, deep within, miners suspire, shake light at the seam. Thank you. Well, let's appreciate the poets once more.